Welcome to the lecture on principal component analysis. Principal component analysis is a, a type of unsupervised learning where we use a particular data model. And uh, in order to do that, we need the following idea, which is the idea of distance to a subspace. So here we're going to have uh, a set of d-dimensional vectors, theta 1 through theta r. And when we take all possible linear combinations of those vectors, we get a subspace. So in other words, I'm looking at combinations of the form uh, x is equal to a1 theta 1 plus a2 theta 2 all the way up to ad theta d. And I'm allowed to pick the a's any way I like. And if I look at all such possible vectors x I can construct, that's a subspace. And it's a d-dimensional, and it's a r-dimensional subspace of r to the d. Um, and we might write that uh, as theta A, where theta is a matrix whose columns are the individual vectors theta I, and A is a vector A1, A2, all the way up to AR of the coefficients. And so the matrix theta times the vector A is equal to the linear combination of the columns of theta and the coefficients in that linear combination are the A i's. And so here we have a D by R matrix and I guess I labeled that incorrectly so let me fix that. That is theta R not theta D. So we have a D by R matrix, theta. And that is the matrix that describes our subspace for us. It defines the subspace. And we can pick any point in the subspace by picking the vector A. Now, if we want to say I've got another a vector X, and I'd like to figure out how far is it from the subspace. Let's draw the picture for that. So here is my subspace. Here is my vector x. And this distance here is what I'd like to know. Um, then, well, what is that? Well, every point in my subspace here, s, has the form theta times a. And so out of all such points theta times a, I want to find the one that's closest to x. And that's this optimization problem right here. Minimize over a x minus theta a. And the norm of x minus theta a is the distance. Um, between x and a particular point theta a within the subspace. Now this is, uh, if I square that objective function, so I look at the distance squared, well minimizing the distance and minimizing the distance squared are the same problem, and so uh, this becomes a least squares problem. And we know what the solution is to least squares problems. It gives the optimal a as theta dagger times x and theta dagger is theta transpose theta inverse theta transpose that matrix and this works if theta has linearly independent columns in which case theta transpose theta is invertible and theta dagger is theta transpose theta inverse theta transpose so that tells us what a is and once we know what a is well then we know theta a 
is this point right here, and which is the uh, the best, the closest point in the subspace to my given point x over here. Um, and we might call this thing x hat. Um, that's the closest point in S to X. People would call it the projection of X onto S. X hat is theta times A, which is just theta times theta transpose theta inverse times theta times X. So here we've simply substituted in for A. Um, and I don't know what that transpose is doing there um, because that transpose this should actually read x hat is equal to theta, theta transpose theta inverse, theta transpose x. Somehow that transpose got misplaced. And so if I want to know what the distance is between x and the subspace, well that's x minus x hat, the norm of x minus x hat. And x hat is this thing here. And so substituting x hat in gives me this rather unpleasant expression. But really, if you look at that unpleasant expression, it's really just, uh, let's call this matrix W. It's the norm of W times x. And W is this matrix identity minus theta, theta transpose theta inverse theta transpose. Yeah, so here's the picture I just drew. This is the case when R, of course, is one, when we've got a one-dimensional subspace. That's S. Um, and then the subspace is a line. There's a theta is a, a matrix, which has only one column, which we might as well think about as a vector. But it certainly makes sense. And the uh, uh, this, uh, theta to the transpose theta inverse theta transpose gives us an a which is a scalar and then if I multiply it by theta I get x hat and that's uh, uh, this this thing here in this case will be a two by two matrix because theta is a two by one vector So what's our data model? Now we've got the idea of distance. Um, the data model is that x should be near to a linear combination of the vectors theta1 through theta r in Rd. In other words, it's near to a subspace. The parameter that defines the subspace is this matrix theta, which is a d by r matrix. So we believe that there is a subspace, and for such a subspace, uh, x, all of the data points x are close to it. Um, now the quantity r, the number, the dimension of the subspace, is also called the rank of the model. Um, and the vectors theta1 through theta r are called the principal components, or the archetypes. So this is called principal component analysis. This is called a PCA model. We have some people call it a low rank model. And our loss function or implausibility is simply the distance between X and S squared. Now it will be convenient to assume that theta has also normal columns. Also normal columns means that theta transpose theta is the identity. Of course, any subspace that um, I want to describe, I can describe it by a set of vectors. And I can choose to, uh, the, the vectors that I'm using to describe the subspace be also normal. And, uh, and so there's no loss of generality in, in making this assumption. 
if you have a theta that doesn't have orthonormal columns, you can compute the orthonormal, uh, a set of orthonormal columns which um, defines the same subspace by the QR factorization of the matrix theta. So you take the QR factorization of the matrix theta and you get rid of theta and you replace it with Q. And then the uh, set of linear combinations of the columns of Q is exactly the same subspace as the set of linear combinations of the columns of the original theta. But the columns of Q are also normal. So when theta, theta transposes the identity, the loss function is the distance between x and s squared, which has this nice matrix expression. It's the norm of w x squared, where the matrix w is identity minus theta, theta transpose theta, inverse theta transpose. And because theta transpose theta is the identity, that's just identity minus theta, theta transpose. Now, computing this norm times x, well, we have that's equal to the norm of x minus theta, theta transpose x norm squared, which is x norm squared plus the norm of theta, theta transpose x norm squared minus twice the cross term. We can simplify that. Um, in particular, uh, the, the norm of theta times any vector v squared is v transpose theta transpose theta v, which is just equal to the norm of v squared. And so, uh, That tells us that this term here is equal to the norm of theta transpose x squared because it's theta times theta transpose x. And uh, as we've just seen, norm of theta v is the norm of v. And this here is minus 2 the norm of theta transpose x squared because it's x transpose theta, theta transpose x. Um, and that was nicely add up uh, to give us minus the norm of theta transpose x squared, which is a very uh, convenient expression right here for the loss function. So now the empirical risk, that's the average on the loss function, the average of the loss function on the data set, simply one on n, sum over i is one to n, and the distance from xi to s squared. And the PCA data model says we should choose also normal theta one through theta r to minimize this empirical risk. So we get a bunch of x's, a bunch of data, we then uh, pick the theta that minimizes the empirical risk and then we can use that model for example to do imputation. So this is the case when R is 1. It has a nice interpretation geometrically. We have all these data points shown in green. Here we're trying to choose a one-dimensional subspace which is just a line and the loss function is the distance between the point and the line, these red distances here. And the sum of the squares, sum of the squares of those distances, that's the, um, uh, that's the empirical risk scaled by n. So we're trying to find the subspace that best fits the data, um, and we're measuring the quality of fit by the normal distance between a point and a subspace, in this case a point and a line. Uh, we can 
uh, look at this in matrix notation. So let's express the empirical risk in matrix notation. As before, we construct the data matrix for the x's. This is just the same one data matrix we used in regression. It's uh, n by d matrix, each row of which is a corresponding uh, data element xi. So the ith row of the matrix x is x little, is little xi transpose. So the empirical PCA loss is then expressible in terms of the matrix by noticing that the sum of the norms of xi squared is uh, the Frobenius norm of the matrix x squared. And then if I want to compute theta transpose times xi, well, I can compute the matrix x times theta, and that will give me a matrix whose uh, ith uh, row is precisely theta transpose xi or uh, transposed. Notice that here there should be a factor of n there. Now in order to fit the PCA model, we start off with our n data points x1 through xn. And we're going to minimize the empirical risk. And we've got the additional constraint that we want to find the theta that minimizes the empirical risk, but also should satisfy theta transpose theta is equal to the identity. In other words, the columns of the matrix theta should be also normal. Um, because the empirical risk is the norm of x minus the norm of x theta, minimizing this quantity over theta is the same as simply maximizing minus, as simply maximizing the norm of x theta f squared. Um, and of course the minus changes the, minima, changes the minimum to a maximum. Now it turns out that this, there's an exact algorithm for doing this. Um, so it's not a heuristic. Um, uh, uh, these algorithms are called the singular value decomposition or the eigenvalue decomposition. Uh, in this class we're not going to go into the details of how those work, um, but it's worth knowing that they exist that their complexity takes is of the order of n d squared, where d is the dimension of x and n is the number of data points. Uh, um, and there are, in fact, more efficient methods when r is much smaller uh, than d. Uh, what do we do when we've got such a data model? One thing we can do is imputation, and the idea is straightforward. We fitted a subspace. Here it is. We've got uh, uh, a data vector with some missing entries. So suppose, for example, we only know x2. Then we know that the true x lies somewhere on that line. And we pick this point right here to fill in the remaining x1 entry. And that corresponds to exactly what it corresponded to in our previous session on imputation. We minimize the loss function over the unknown components of x with the components of x that are known fixed. Now, in order to find the uh, intersection point right here, the way we do that is we have to find the A. Remember, A parameterizes the subspace. So we have to find the A corresponding to that intersection point. That corresponds to minimizing this objective function. So here, we're looking for the, uh, uh, the point A that minimizes the norm of the difference between x minus theta a. 
that's the point in the subs place uh, which is as close as possible to x. However, we don't use the entire norm because some components of x are unknown. And as a result, we simply use only those entries of x which are known, and that gives us the sum over all i in the known set of xi minus theta a sub i squared. And that finds exactly this point right here. And if we look at the corresponding x hat, which is theta a, and look at the ith component of it, that will give us the missing entries of x hat. Now when we're fitting our model, we start off with data points x1 through xn, and we would like to choose the best theta so that we are minimizing the empirical risk. Um, now the way we do that is we uh, look at the distance between x and s where we've parameterized the subspaces s by theta. In order to compute that distance, in turn, we have to compute the optimal a. The optimal a tells us which point in the subspace is the closest to x. And there's a different a for each of the different x's. The computation that goes into that is this computation right here, we find the a that minimizes xi minus theta a. And that we know is ai is theta transpose theta inverse theta transpose xi. And if we're restricting ourselves to only looking at theta with also normal columns, then that's just theta transpose xi because theta transpose theta is the identity. And we can write this in a convenient way. We can have a matrix A where the ith row is the corresponding ith A transposed. And so now the matrix A will be an N by R matrix. And that A is going to be equal to x theta. Uh, let me erase that and write it correctly. And that just says a is equal to x theta, simply says equivalently that a transpose is equal to theta transpose x transpose, and therefore that the ith row of a, a i is equal to theta transpose x i. It's simply writing this as a matrix equation. Now, uh, once we've got the A, we can correspondingly work out the X tilde, the corresponding closest point. There's our subspace, here's our point, there's the closest point. This is X I, and this is X tilde I. And X tilde I, well, that's what AI tells us, X tilde I is just um, theta times ai. Now we can write that as a matrix equation as well. In the same way, we'll write x tilde having its components x tilde 1 transpose up to x tilde n transpose the n rows of x tilde. And then the equa this equation here corresponds exactly to the matrix equation x tilde is equal to a theta transpose. So our empirical risk is the average of the distance between xi and x tilde i. If we forget about this, the factor of 1 on n, then that becomes the Frobenius norm of x minus x tilde squared, each row of x being the corresponding xi, and each row of x tilde being the corresponding x tilde i. And so the Frobenius norms gives us the sum of the squares of the differences in the norms of the vector pairs. We could write this like this, since x tilde is uh, uh, is a theta transpose, 
and a is x theta, and just substituting those two in gives us x tilde is x theta theta transpose. Uh, another thing we could do is we can simply say x tilde is a theta transpose, and so let's look at this expression directly. And that says that, well, we, we start off with x, and our job is to find both an a and a theta. Of course, once you know theta, well then a is given to you. a is theta transpose x. Conversely, um, once you know a, well then x tilde is given to you. But here we're simply saying let's try and find simultaneously both a and theta transpose. And the, exp the idea here is that this is a matrix factorization. We want to find a matrix A, which has to have the dimensions n by r, and a matrix theta transpose, which has to have the dimensions r by d. I guess this should say a d here. So that x is approximately A theta transpose. And the dimensions look like this. The dimensions are, there is A. And that has to be approximately equal. Sorry, that's x. That has to be approximately equal to a theta transpose, where this is n and this is d. This is therefore n and r, and this is therefore r and d. Now, in general, if r is small, one will not be able to find exactly a pair of matrices A and theta transpose such that x is A times theta transpose. Um, and so this is an approximate matrix factorization problem. And what PCA is doing is finding the closest matrix to x that is a product of an n by r and an r by D matrix. Now the mapping A is theta transpose can be thought of as an embedding. It's taking an X and giving a vector A. The vector X has dimension D and the vector A has dimension R. So this is an embedding which is taking X in, which is, may have a large dimension and giving us a, an A which would normally have a much smaller dimension. R would normally be much smaller than D. And so it's a dimension reduction. We can think about A as a compressed feature vector when X is the original feature vector. Um, now, when we've done feature engineering in the past, we've done things like constructing products and applying nonlinear maps to X to construct features. But here, the embedding is based on the data set. The embedding is being learned. And so this is a learned linear embedding from the d-dimensional space of x's to the r-dimensional space of a's. Now one of the nice things about this embedding is that it approximately preserves distances. So that points that are far apart in our original d-dimensional space are also far apart in our r-dimensional space. And points that are close are also close. But because r is less than d, it cannot do that exactly. And so it does that as well as it can. Let's have a look at this. So this property that the distances are almost preserved is called the approximate isometry property of PCA. An isometry, say a map from r to the p to r to the q, a map is called an isometry if it preserves distances, which means that if I've got two, uh, if I've got two vectors x and x tilde, I map them both, both under f, I get f of x and f of x tilde, and the distance between f of x and f of x tilde is approximately the same as the distance between x and x tilde. The most well-known simple example of this is uh, f of x is q times x, where q is a matrix which has orthonormal columns. q transpose q is the identity then uh, uh, we could see 
that the norm of Q of Qx minus Qx tilde squared, well that's equal to Q times the norm of X minus X tilde squared, which is equal to X minus X tilde transpose Q transpose Q, X minus X tilde, and Q transpose Q is the identity, so this is equal to the norm of X minus X tilde squared. Now, what we're doing in PCA, our loss function is the norm of x squared minus the norm of theta transpose x squared. And the, the, uh, the theta transpose x, well, that's precisely a. So this is the norm of x squared minus the norm of a squared. Once you know x, well, then you know a. And so what we're doing is we're trying to make norm of x squared approximately equal to the norm of a squared. In other words, this means that the embedding is going to be an, is an approximate isometry. The smaller we can make the loss function, the closer to an isometry it'll be. In particular, we'll see that uh, uh, often we choose r to be 2 or 3, simply so that we can visualize the data effectively. We'll be able to, by picking r as 2, we can plot all of our data points in the plane. Each xi gets mapped to an ai, and these ai are two-dimensional vectors. And often by doing that, the PCA embedding picks for us and shows for us a map of our data in two dimensions, where points that are close are similar, and points that are far apart are dissimilar. We'll see an example of that. So the example we're going to look at is called latent semantic indexing. The idea here is that we have a corpus, a body of documents, a, a collection of documents. Each of our records, UI, will be a document. In that corpus of documents, we can look at all the words and count up the number of different words that are in there. And we'll call that number D, the number of unique words in all the documents. Now, now that we've got uh, uh, D, we can number all of the words that show up anywhere in our uh, corpus of documents from 1 through D. And that means that gives us a very natural way of embedding documents. Um, we can look at a document um, and uh, we can set X1 to be the number of times word 1 occurs in that document x2 to be the number of times word 2 occurs in the document, and so on. So we'll have a histogram of the word occurrences for each document. And that's a very reasonable embedding um, uh, from uh, uh, which maps a document to a d-dimensional vector. Uh, in fact, we don't tend to use that particular embedding, but we use a very similar embedding, an embedding which has the same idea where x, the jth component of x, is approximately equal to the number of times the jth unique word occurs in that document and is larger the more often the word occurs, but is not quite that. Um, and let's see why not. Now, we're going to use two, in order to construct this particular embedding, we're going to use two quantities. The first is called the term frequency of word j. And so that what that is, is that if you give me a particular document, I count up the number of occurrences of word j in that document, and I divide it by the total number of words in that document. Um, so that tells me what fraction of words in the document are word j. That's called the term frequency of word j in document u. Now, I can also look at a different quantity, the document frequency of word j. And that is, if I look at the entire uh, corpus of documents, and I look at the number of documents in which that word occurs, 
and I divide by the number, total number of documents I have. Um, now, why is this a good idea? Uh, if we just kept a histogram of the term frequencies, that would certainly make a vector which would have large entries to words that show up a lot in that document and small entries for words that don't show up a lot. Trouble is, is that some of the large entries would be kind of meaningless. They'd be words like the, if, and, but. And uh, those words are words sharp a lot in all documents. And so as a result, we would like to scale in some way to de-emphasize words which are popular words in all documents. And that's what we do with the document frequency. And so this thing is called the TFIDF embedding the term frequency inverse document frequency embedding. And it's not quite the ratio of the term frequency to the document frequency, but it's the term frequency multiplied by the log of one over the document frequency. And this kind of does the following. If a word J occurs very often in a document and it doesn't occur very often in all documents, then the TFIDF embedding will be large. And here we uh, um, have a way of discounting the occurrence of very common words such as the. So let's look at a specific example. Uh, here we're going to have two texts, The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant and The Problems of Philosophy by Bertrand Russell. Uh, these are both very famous philosophical works, uh, both in a specific area of philosophy, and they're famous uh, in part because they take opposite, opposing views. Um, and these, we're going, the way we've analyzed these is we've taken 50 excerpts from each of these books. Each excerpt has about 3,000 characters. Uh, for each excerpt, we've taken, we split them into words, removed any punctuation or capitalization. And that gives us uh, a total over the whole corp corpus of 3,566 unique words. We embed these using TFIDF embedding we standardize and we apply PCA. So here uh, is an example of a thousand characters of Kant. Uh, you can read this and get the sense of what it sounds like. And a thousand characters of Russell. Now, um, just based on a thousand characters, of course, you can't glean too much from the meaning. And the question is, can we learn something that would enable us to uh, distinguish these two documents. And so here, this is the embedding that PCA comes up with. We've picked R as 2. We've got a data matrix X, which is 100 by 2,262. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, uh, 100 different excerpts, 50 from Russell, 50 from Kant. Now each data point, each vector xi, gets mapped to an ai. That ai, of course, is just theta transpose times xi. And because we picked r as 2, each document corresponds to a vector in the plane. And so we can plot all our documents, and here they are, colored the blue ones corresponding to Kant, the red ones corresponding to Russell, and you can see they're quite well separated. And that's one of the things PCA does for us, is it shows us the structure. It's given us an embedding where it has tried to spread out the features as much as possible. Now, we have uh, a theta, which is uh, 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 a vector, uh, which is a matrix, which is um, uh, d by 2, has two columns, theta 1 and theta 2. 
Um, and the way we should think about that is that these are our basis vectors for our subspace S. Each entry of theta1 corresponds to a particular word, same for each entry of theta2. And so here we can take all of our words and plot for each word theta1 and theta2 the corresponding entries of so theta 1 i and theta 2 i the corresponding entries of theta 1 and theta 2 for word i now what does this mean for example let's pick a word let's pick this word down here which is representation now the word representation here has uh, a theta 2 which is negative and a theta 1 which is quite small close to zero and it means that if we have a document in which the word representation shows up a significant number of times, then the corresponding embedded vector A will have an A2, which is shifted negative by those words, and an A1 that isn't really changed. Similarly, if I look at a word over here, this word is about, that's got a uh, positive theta 2 and a negative theta 1. And as a result, if the word about occurs significantly in a particular document, then the co corresponding embedded A will be moved, so here's the origin, will be moved in this direction. So now, we can look back at our texts and we can say that because Kant's documents are down here and Russell's documents are up here, that suggests that words, these words over here are words that Kant tends to use and these words over here are words that Russell tends to use. Uh, let's uh, look at some of these. Uh, I happen to know that there's transcendental over here and conception over here. If we look at uh, Kant, there we can see in the middle transcendental conception right there. And so the reason why these documents split up like this and that we can distinguish Russell from Kant is they tend to use different words with different frequencies and that shows up and is detected by PCA. Now of course it doesn't always happen that a two-dimensional embedding will split your documents so nicely like this. But nonetheless, this gives us a great choice for an embedding which will enable methods such as classification or regression, which we learned earlier in the class, to do a good job. And uh, we're seeing that here. Yeah, we may want need to use an R as higher dimension, in which case we won't be able to visualize it but it will still make our classification and our regression methods work well. Now I think that brings us to the end of the class. Officially we have one more lecture scheduled for next week but I think there is no need to try to fit one more topic in in one lecture and so we're going to stop here. I know it's been a, a very challenging quarter uh, and uh, I appreciate you all working hard on this class during such difficult times. Uh, despite the continuing challenges we are facing in spring 2020, I hope you've had a, a productive uh, quarter and I hope you've, uh, this class has gone well for you and I wish you all the best for the summer.